You might be concerned about the biodiversity crisis and want to plant native plants to feed the wider food web, but which plants to choose? There are standout plants that host more life than others, and it would be wise for us to all recognize these giants of biodiversity when we rewild at home. The entire food web is dependent on native plants. A plant adapted to survive local conditions absorbs the energy from the sun and converts it into carbohydrates and nutrients. And only insects have the ability to convert plants into fats and proteins, which then go on to support the entire food web. We have a video about gardening for bugs that goes into more detail on this. For the last 100 years or so, those of us in the West have been destroying that food web and reducing the flow of life. But we, my humble viewers, want to be the people pumping up the food web. We are the ecological maximalists, the biodiversity berserkers. We want to increase the number of plants in our ecosystems that host insect populations to then support things like box turtles, horn toads, and cedar waxwings, and ribbon snakes. Chill out, they're non-venomous. So which plants do we choose? Do we just need to stuff as many plants as possible in these yards? Is it better to have a thousand prairie nymph plants or a thousand different prairie grasses? Plus one plant equals plus one more bugs? Not necessarily. Bear with me as I paint a picture. In architecture, there's something known as a keystone. This is a stone at the center of an arch that all the other stones lean on for support. When you remove the keystone, the entire arch collapses. In biology, there is a concept known as keystone species. These are species that function in a similar way to that central stone. Their lifestyles and habits support many other species and help create a functioning and stable ecosystem. And once they're removed, the entire ecosystem collapses. A famous example of this happening in reverse is the wolves of Yellowstone National Park. Once they were reintroduced, they positively affected so many species that even the course of the rivers changed in the park. And there are some plants that are so important to the surrounding ecosystem that we can consider them keystone species as well. And in North America, there's one big mamma jamma that stands out among the rest, the oak. North America is the spiritual home of oaks. Mexico alone has 160 species present. The U.S. isn't too shabby with nine individual species. And these members of the Quercus genius host a sh ton of caterpillars. I mean, a lot of them. We're talking about close to 500 caterpillars in each individual region and over 900 all combined. I typed oak into the Native Wildlife Federation's Native Plant Finder and it said that oaks can host 468 species of caterpillar in my area alone. We use caterpillars hosted as a metric because birds require caterpillars to raise their young, so it's a good scale to see how much one plant affects the wider food web. And that's not to mention the dozens of other insects that base their entire life cycle on oak trees, like stick bugs, tree hoppers, lace bugs, leaf beetles, weevils, grasshoppers. <laughs> not to mention how the acorns support our ecosystems, feeding wild turkeys, blue jays, flying squirrels, possums, raccoons, and hopefully more frequently in the future, human beings. Oaks are a powerhouse of biodiversity and planting one can invite the diversity of birds to dinner that will then poop up an entire forest in no time. Doug Tallamy has an entire book just dedicated to the various forms of life that depend on the oak throughout the year. Like all of his work, it's highly recommended. White oaks are quick growing, beautiful trees that are native to most of the Eastern US. So it's a go-to tree to plant for most Americans wanting to massively increase the biodiversity of their yard in one fell swoop. The next two runners up for caterpillars hosted are members of the plum family at 270 caterpillars hosted, which in our part of Texas can mean Mexican plums, black cherries, and cherry laurel, all beautiful trees, some with very tasty fruit. The genus after that, the willows with 229 caterpillars hosted. The famous weeping willow is actually native to China, so you'll want to go with a native species like the black willow, which happens to be native to most major population centers in the United States. Pecans or hickories, cottonwoods, maples, crab apples, and pines, these are all pretty close behind these other trees by just a dozen caterpillars or so. So all these are massively important for our ecosystems. And keep in mind, when I mention a tree here, make sure that this tree is native to your area or these numbers don't make any sense. Here's a link for the plant finder tool that we use to get accurate numbers for our area, but I always double check historic ranges of plants to be sure that something they suggest is actually native. Sometimes they leave out native plants too, so it's a good place to start, but always continue to learn on your own. I like to think of this caterpillar metric as a way to gamify the biodiversity project in our yard. 
when I start to think about it, I get obsessed. Okay, if we can just squeeze in one willow here, we've got the three trees that support the most insects. That's the potential 967 caterpillars. But if I also want to see the rare zebra swallowtail, or why not try to catch a glimpse of the rare yucca moth? Get greedy with it. And once you've planted everything, you can stop worrying about the numbers and just enjoy the show. So you might be thinking that all trees are good for biodiversity. What kind of tree doesn't support biodiversity? A non-native one. Chinese tallow, Chinese fringe tree, crepe myrtles. Yucky. They offer nothing in terms of biodiversity and reduce space that could be filled with an equally beautiful tree that supports life in your region. But even native trees have different impacts when it comes to bug life. A kidney wood tree supports two species of caterpillar in my region. The pawpaw only supports 12 species. But that doesn't mean that they're not important ecologically. It just means that if you want to have the biggest bang for your bug or tree, you might want to consider another option. Kidney woods are supposed to be very aromatic and pawpaws provide delicious fruit and are the only host plant for the zebra swallowtail. So these things have their place, but would take less priority in a planting trying to maximize biodiversity per square foot. And if you don't want to plant a tree, there are plenty of flowers, grasses, and shrubs that can also host a wide variety of caterpillars and other insects. Goldenrod stands out, hosting 82 caterpillars in our area, as well as creating its own ecosystem with aphids and their predators and providing nectar for pollinators, including monarchs during their long trek back to Mexico in fall. Sunflowers native to our area come in second at 81 caterpillars hosted. Grasses like big blue stem and little blue stem were once mainstays in the prairie ecosystems that grew between our forests. And those grasses host 22 caterpillars each in our region. To add further complexity, some plants like the yuccas here in Texas host a decent 30 number of caterpillars, but almost every single one of the caterpillars can only grow on the yucca. Without those yuccas, those 30 caterpillars are extinct locally. Things to consider when we're bringing plants and bugs into our yards. And bushes like hawthorns and blueberries can host about 100 caterpillars each. Both of these are awesome plants that make fruit that's edible to humans, as well as birds. And if you're on the East Coast all the way to Texas, there's a native blueberry species growing near you. Most people don't know this. Blueberries remind me of another fact. Many pollinators are specialists, meaning they can only eat the nectar from certain plants. So while some bees can get nectar and pollen from any plant, most require a specific plant for survival. Luckily, there's a lot of overlap with plants that have pollinator specialists and plants that host a crap ton of bugs. There are several blueberry bees in the US that require blueberry pollen. By planting a blueberry or farkleberry bush, you invite these cute little bees into your yard and support 100 caterpillars that can munch on the leaves as well. We were overjoyed to see fuzzy little blueberry bees the first spring after planting our blueberry bushes. The same story is true with goldenrod, with many bees being adapted to gather this pollen only. Asters are another group of plants that host many insects and lots of specialist pollinators, and they also happen to be very aggressive colonizers. If you find a strange weed growing in your yard with pretty white flowers, you probably have some beneficial native asters. Our yard is currently full of Spanish needles, or Biden's alba, which is constantly covered in bugs, and its leaves feed YouTubers as well. The great thing about a lot of these mega host plants like oaks, willows, goldenrod, asters, and sunflowers is that they are extremely hardy and will colonize like no one's business. Construction sites near us are often full of willow saplings and asters. Any empty lot, if left unmowed long enough, will start to fill up with goldenrod. And once established, no drought, flood, or freeze is taking that goldenrod out. Squirrels and blue jays will turn your front yard into an oak orchard if you turn your back. These plants don't have to be coddled. We're lucky that the plants that host the most life will also be naturally abundant if we just give them a chance. Most of us don't realize how many little living things are out there, but by simply planting the plants that are best adapted to our regions, we can invite all of these things back without any other work required. And this is why some people consider humans as a keystone species. While the last 200 years have shown a level of unprecedented environmental destruction, we have the capacity to exponentially increase the biodiversity and functioning of ecosystems. Like we see in places like the indigenous chinampas of Mexico City that are incredibly productive agriculturally, yet increase biodiversity locally. We don't have to separate nature in small preserves away from people. We can be good stewards and bring nature into our yards and workspaces. 
we can reintroduce the keystone species that we removed, we can restore the waterways that we interrupted, and bring the healthy fires back to the prairies and forests that need them. We can become a keystone people again, and at home, it starts with planting the right plant for your area. If you enjoyed this video, click like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to get notifications about our next videos and the projects we have in the works. Also, take a look at our Patreon if you want to support us or maybe suggest the next topic we make a video on. Happy gardening, friends. Later.